I want everyone to imagine a romantic scene. All right, if your romantic scene included a farm, raise your hand. <laughs> All right, there's a few, but I'm not seeing many hands go up, and, and frankly, I'd be surprised if they did. But the reality is, the fact is, we're bombarded with romantic scenes and notions about our food and where it comes from. Walk down the aisle of your grocery store and look at the brand labels and descriptions. Is there anything that isn't farm fresh, nest fresh, nature fresh, nature's best, nature's habit, nature's sweet, or 100% natural? And is there anything that doesn't come from wholesome, happy places like Sunridge Farms, Cobblestone Farms, Sunnyside Farms, Organic Valley, or the farm on nature's path? <laughs> the, we're, we're in love with the idea of food that's delivered by Mother Nature herself. And romantic notions about natural food and what the farm ought to be fuel a lot of anxiety, a lot of emotion, and a lot of questions. Why are we tinkering with our food? Why are scientists traipsing through our farms? Why can't we just live with what nature gives us to eat? The reality is we've been tinkering and modifying our food for a long time. I'll give you an example. About 10,000 years ago, in what is now Mexico, some of the earliest farmers on earth started cultivating a wild plant called teacente. Teacente had edible grain, but it was pretty sparse on the plant, and it was encased in a hard woody shell. It was hard to eat. But over time, these early farmers recognized changes, spontaneous changes, what we now know as mutations. And some of these were beneficial. Some affected the hard shell around the grain. Some affected the amount of grain per plant. When these were recognized, the farmers specifically saved from those plants and put those in the subsequent crops. What these farmers were doing was something called artificial selection. And it's the same thing modern plant breeders do today. Within a few thousand years, of humans arriving in the Americas, our native ancestors, our ancient ancestors, developed a food that didn't exist in nature, corn. This same story repeats itself for most of our major crops, most, most all of our crops. Ancestral bananas were like thin-skinned, seed-filled okra pods. Diverse wild grasses some with names like goat grass, contributed to domesticated wheat. There's almost nothing we grow for food today that is easily recognizable out in the wild, and that's because of ancient domesticators, the original agricultural technologists, and now modern plant breeders using the incredible power of genetics to serve human needs. Science is irreversibly embedded in the modern farm. I was born in 1960. That was only 15 years beyond when the number of tractors surpassed the number of working horses on the farm. In 1960, 8% of the workforce was a farmer, but they were pretty productive. Each farmer, on average, fed 26 other people. That's pretty good. Today, with far fewer farmers, comprising less than 2% of the workforce, each one, on average, provides for 155 people. That's due almost entirely to advances, agricultural, technological advances based on science, higher yielding and better performing seeds, precision machinery, 
incredible forecasting and digital tools, better ways to manage pests. Think about this a different way. What if we could scrub all of the contributions of agricultural technology developed over my lifetime? That is to say, what if we could bring back the farm of 1960 to serve our needs today? The first thing you'd have to account for is today's farm is about twice as productive per acre as it was in 1960. That means to produce what we do today, you would need twice as much farm and pasture land. That's another 900 million acres. For, we would need a total of 1.8 billion acres. Do you know how much that is? That's about the area, the, the amount of land in the continental United States, including the cities, the mountains, the forests, the deserts. That would be a big problem. We would also need about twice as much irrigation water as we did per acre in 1960 because technological advances have given us much more efficient use of irrigation water from rivers, lakes, and groundwater sources. Irrigation today accounts for about 60% of all of the freshwater withdrawals that we use in this country. Who wants to increase that amount, let alone double it? Without advances in plant breeding since 1960, allowing much faster development of drought tolerant climate resilient, disease resistant crops, we would have had devastating crop failures during that drought from 2012 and annual instability of the wheat supply due to continually evolving diseases. Just like cars, computers, and seemingly everything else in our lives, science and technology have had a huge impact on the farm. But is it sufficient and is it sustainable? After one more generation, planet Earth is going to have about two billion more people to feed. And people around the world are going to expect a better diet. By the middle of this century, we're going to have to produce and protect about 70% more food than what we produce today. Technology that hasn't been invented yet is going to be required to grow yields and protect yields without overconsuming fresh water, without additional farmland, we don't have it, with less waste and spoilage, with better preservation of soil, and with more carbon sequestered in the soil, and with far fewer greenhouse gas emissions that are contributing to an unacceptable pace of climate change. Our grand challenge is not just providing food security for a growing, changing world, but rather doing so in an ecologically responsible way that doesn't do irreparable damage to the environment and the planet. Just like the moonshot from the 1960s or the Mars shot in the decades ahead, we can't get there without science. There's also something else we need to confront. Today, there are about 800 million smallholder farmers around the world cultivating one or a few acres of land for themselves, their families, and their villages. They're overrepresented among the 900 million people living in extreme poverty on one to two dollars per day and they're among the world's most food insecure. There are people like who Gaitu Dugama grew up with as a young man. I was born and raised in a small village in Western Ethiopia, uh, and my parents are um, subsistence farmers. So growing up, I was surrounded by crops and livestock. Um, so until I left home, which is after high school, uh, I was doing um, the very labor-intensive 
hand reading before and after school, um, which is part of the life that my parents still do. Gaitu, his parents, and his brothers and sisters were the labor force on their small farm in the Ethiopian village of Kokafe, raising corn, teff, a few vegetables, and some cows. Their seeds produced low yields. They lacked fertilizer. They lacked equipment. Gaitu and his father prepared land with a plow pulled by two oxen. They planted seeds by hand. And Gaitu, as he just said, pulled weeds, lots of weeds, before and after school. Gaitu and his family didn't benefit from science on the farm like you and I did. Neither did the hundreds of displaced farmers who were relocated to Kokafe during the horrifying famines of the 1980s. Gaitu made it through the sixth grade in Kokafe, the highest you could go in his village. He made it through high school in a town 20 miles away that he walked to and from every weekend with his brothers and sisters. He persevered. He kept achieving, step by step. He graduated from college. And in 2006, he received a PhD from the University of Pretoria. Gaitu Dugama became a scientist. Gaitu's life and my life intersected about four years ago when he joined us at the Danforth Plant Science Center in a team led by Nigel Taylor, working to address one of the biggest threats to food security affecting 30 million smallholder farmers in East and Central Africa specifically those who cultivate cassava as a staple food. For these farmers, cassava is a true food security crop. When other crops fail due to drought or poor soil, cassava thrives. But it's got an Achilles heel. Cassava is highly susceptible to damaging viruses, like one called the brown streak virus. When the brown streak virus gets into a cassava field, there is no harvest, and there is no cure. For scientists looking to make an impact, that's the kind of problem that holds our attention. In my case, for 35 years, that's how long I've been working and my lab has been working to figure out why plants get sick when they're infected by viruses. We've studied how viruses replicate and how they move through plants. And we've studied how plants defend themselves against viruses. We learned, for example, that plants have an antiviral immune system. But it's not like the immune system in me and you. It involves something called gene silencing. The plant literally turns off the virus genes. We and many other groups have shown that you can use gene silencing to immunize plants achieving the same outcome as when we get the measles vaccine. In an ambitious humanitarian project, Gaitu, Nigel, their team here, and their partners in East Africa are using gene silencing to develop improved cassava varieties that are immune to the brown streak virus. They're doing this by making a tiny, genetic modification that activates gene silencing, immunizes the plants, and they've shown that this works to protect the plants against the brown streak virus in the field in Kenya and Uganda. This is the same technology that we have access to in the United States and that protects some of our crops against damaging viruses. And in the future, when our crops are threatened by new viruses, just like when Zika or Ebola viruses emerge in human populations, 
We'll use gene silencing, or we'll use accelerated breeding, or gene editing, or some other technology based on science to solve the problem and protect our food. I want you to consider three questions. Is it okay if science and technology that assures our food security bypasses another generation of smallholder farmers like Gaytu's family? How certain are you that we can achieve food security for 10 billion people and environmental security without far better nature-compatible technology on the farm. And finally, as you walk the aisles of your grocery store next week, how comfortable are you forming opinions and making choices based on romantic notions about your food and where it comes from?